I'm Douglas Mason, CEO of Naturally Splendid, symbol NSP on the TSX Venture Exchange. Naturally Splendid is a biotechnology and consumer products company focused on the global cannabis and health markets. Naturally Splendid is expanding distribution in this rapidly growing market with products currently in Canada, the USA, South Korea, Germany, and Australia. To view our comprehensive company presentation and for more information, please visit our website at naturallysplendid.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Stuart Muir, Executive Director of the Resource Work Society. Welcome back to the show, Stuart. Thank you, Jim. Stuart, some myths that were busted during the BC Utilities Commission inquiry into the price of gasoline in British Columbia... By the way, we should let people know right away, this was a handcuffed inquiry. They weren't supposed to look into anything that was caused by government rules, regulations, or taxes. In other words, uh, what? How much of the price of gasoline is actually taxes and government regulations? What proportion? Yeah, that's, uh, I think, 45 cents in a liter or 50 cents in a liter is your tax, depending on where you are. And, of course, uh, the Lower Mainland in B.C. has something nobody else in North America has, and that's an 18 and a half cent a liter transit tax. That's correct. Again, they weren't allowed to look at that. So, uh, what, what did this commission find, and uh, what were some of the myths that they busted? Yeah, I, I think it's interesting because a lot of the media coverage has suggested that there is this mysterious gap that represents some sort of price gouging by oil companies to get more out of consumers than they really should be. But when you look closer to the report and actually read it, um, I've realized that what the BC Utilities Commission actually says in the report is that there's no price fixing, there's no gouging, there's no collusion, there's, there's no monopolistic behavior, there's none of that, no evidence whatsoever. So ignore what you've seen in the headlines. What they did point to was this price discrepancy, and it's not gouging, it's a discrepancy of, of 13 cents, which existed back in the spring of 2019 in April when, due to a number of factors beyond normal control, that were making for a great scarcity of, uh, of, of products for the pump, diesel and gasoline, in Metro Vancouver. And that's really, I think, what is the unsolved mystery, even after this body of, of energy experts spent some amount of time looking into the issue. We still don't really know, although I've got you know some ideas on this, which I, I think are very important to understand. So the takeaway there, Jim, is that uh, if, if you came away from the, the reports about this issue as, oh boy, that's really some gouging by the oil companies, that's not what the report said at all, and uh, let's go into this in more detail. Well, what are your theories? Well, I, I think when you want, if you want to understand uh, the dynamics of the market, you have to first of all understand that we have limited access for refined products to the Lower Mainland. It's no secret why. Just look at those mountains. It makes things not just here but south of the border uh, more challenging. There aren't any pipelines uh, in in you know California that that reach them. They they have to get their stuff shipped in. Uh, we we have uh, not quite as bad a problem here. But we, we do have constraint. As a result of this, we truck the fuel in, we, we rail it in, which is a way more costly and inefficient and not to mention hazardous way of, of transporting liquid hydrocarbons than pipeline, which is the safest way, of course. Um, the background for this is that British Columbia is uh, soon, hopefully, to get an expanded facility so we don't have to rely on one piece of 1950s infrastructure to get all of those fuels to us, plus other methods, um, we're going to have the Trans Mountain expansion, which will triple the capacity of fuels and crude oil to get to the coast. So that's a good thing if you're a consumer, and it's also good if you care about the environment because it protects the, uh, the, the rivers that these fuels cross over when they're being shipped around by rail and by truck. Um, so when you get further into the issue, though, you realize that there's a very interesting market that's been artificially created by by the provincial government of B.C. primarily. They have this thing called the Low Carbon Fuel Standard 
It's been in application for a number of years. Basically, what it uh, sets out to do is to, over time, cause to be reduced the greenhouse gas intensity of the fuels we use. And the main way to do that is just very simple. You use additives like biofuels that have fewer uh, fossil fuel components. So they can, in accounting terms at least, claim them to be lower carbon. Um, the thing is, it's very expensive to add, you know, things like ethanol, gasoline, these different blends. It's very costly because BC, it's only 4 million people. It's in a marketplace of North America that's, of course, way over 300 million people. There's some other places in Canada that do have a similar standard, but it's all different. People have different standards. California's got this, but they're different. So, um, what, what we're trying to do in BC is cause people to consume a specialized formula of gasoline and diesel that consequently costs a lot more. Now, the Utilities Commission wanted to believe that the cost of this would maybe be four cents a liter. But that's only for sourcing the mixture ingredients. It ignores all of the extra transportation, the fact there's a, a huge uh, a bureaucracy that had to be created in the provincial government, of course, to police all this, which everyone's going to police them, uh, the transportation issues, the fact that it's a scarce, these are scarce ingredients to add to our fuels, and so that adds to cost. So when, when you hear people saying, oh, it's only four cents a liter, it doesn't make any difference, well, that's not really true at all. It could be up to, I think, uh, you know, 13, 14 cents a liter, which actually explains that entire gap that, that was in the headlines. So the spin on this has been merciless. I think the provincial government is looking for political gains. It's always good for some politicians in their minds anyways, to point the finger at big, bad industry. That's what they're obviously trying to do here, is place the blame for high gas prices. But really, and here's the really weird thing about it, Jim, is that all the policies of the provincial government are in the direction of forcing people to use less fuel by making it more expensive. You know, we have the carbon tax, which generates uh, a lot of revenues for the government. It's going to go up by $5 a year till it hits $50 a ton. That'll be in line with the national targets. It's one thing we've had here for a long time. And, and the whole purpose of the carbon tax is to, is to cause people to think about other transportation options. Instead of filling the, my, my car with gas, I'm going to you know, jump on a bus or on a sky train if you have that option. Not everyone does. And, and so on the one hand, you've got the government saying, oh, it's terrible, there's expensive gas. And then on the other hand, they're saying, we're going to make gas really expensive, so you can't use it and are looking at other options. How's that for a contradiction, Jim? Well, it's uh, the perfect one. <laughs> mm, exactly. You, you know, here's one thing that maybe helps to understand it, if you want to go one layer deeper. So why would such a contradictory mis mixed message be, be uh, you know, so delicately employed in in the pursuit of trying to persuade the public of a point of view that, that uh, they're, they're being gouged. I, I think if you look at the books of the BC government, and this is totally outside of politics, it's you know the money side of providing services to the people who reside in British Columbia. It costs a lot of money to do that. Right now, in 2019, the BC government is forecasting two and a half billion dollars worth of revenue from carbon tax and fuel taxes. Two and a half billion is a huge component of revenues. It is uh, probably triple what comes in from tobacco. Now, fewer people smoking these days means uh, decline in tobacco. We've seen the property transfer tax that applies when you purchase a house. We've seen that revenue decline because of policies deliberately intended to uh, reduce the, uh, or rather increase the amount of revenue from certain segments, but it's had the impact of slowing down the entire real estate market, so government has less money coming from there. They have very strong motivation to uh, protect that two and a half billion dollars worth of fuel-related income. Um, so it's it's a very interesting situation we've got here. Well, my question is: if everybody switched to e-cars, where are they going to? How are they going to replace that two and a half billion? Yeah, and you might ask: well, what is that revenue used for? Uh, some of its general revenues, some of its environmental initiatives, but they also have to rebuild roads, and there's a public expense 
associated with that. Whenever you go fill your tanks, some of that money you're paying in taxes is there to rebuild the roads because you drive around and your tires, you know, they, they wear out the roads, trucks especially, bigger tr- vehicles. And so you have a electric vehicle. You think, yeah, this is great. No more gasoline. I don't have to pay any gas taxes. It's fantastic. But you know that car, that that hybrid car, that electric car, it's stuffed with heavy batteries. A, an electric car has got hundreds of pounds of, of copper in it, of course, very heavy. So you're still wearing out the roads by driving around. Now, what if you get to the point, and it's 2040, and this vision of the B.C. government, I, I think it's a bit of a hallucination, but they say it's their vision to eliminate gasoline-powered cars. Uh, what happens to all that $2.5 billion in revenue then that they need? Do they... You know, they're going to triple the tax or quadruple the tax on cigarettes. Well, people won't be smoking then, hardly, I I project. And other forms of revenue, the real estate tax, how much will that bring in? Who knows? Anyone's guess. So what are they going to be taxing? How are they going to be taxing? That's a That was actually raised by the Utilities Commission in a little bit of an aside. I think it's a great question, Jim. Yeah, well, I could see them, well, uh, when you renew your insurance uh, you have to give them your odometer r- reading and they're going to start charging you per k travel of course there's no guarantee all of that travel will be in british columbia what if you go visit your relatives in winnipeg by car oh boy are they yeah, are they going to charge you for that <laughs> or when you plug in right now uh, one of the benefits of having an electric car is that you can go plug in and lots of buildings and shopping centers and municipal authorities and airports love the idea of giving you free electricity, but when everyone is doing that, or more than now anyways, uh, are they going to be so generous in offering free electricity? And of course, if you're powering at home, you have to, you know, set up uh, your, your house to have the right, the right, uh, uh, plumbing for the electricity, so to speak. And that costs you money as well when you're charging. So, um, maybe they could tax the electricity. Well, we know governments, they'll tax anything if they can. And, of course, now, uh, officially, they're taxing air because service stations are charging you to uh, pump up your tires, So, and there's tax on that. So now the government does literally have a tax on air. You have an eye for this kind of thing, Jim, I must say. We'll have more with Stuart Muir right after this. Cypress Development Corp. is developing a world-class lithium resource in the heart of Clayton Valley, Nevada. The size of the resource makes the Clayton Valley project a premier asset with the potential to impact the future of lithium supply. Cypress Development Corp. trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol CYP, the OTCQB, symbol CYDVF, and on Frankfurt, symbol C1Z1. For more information, please visit our website, cypressdevelopmentcorp.com. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia and the Yukon, trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the OTCQB, symbol ABNAF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Stuart Muir. Stuart, the Federal Court of Appeal says uh, six Aboriginal groups uh, can go ahead and challenge the latest pipeline approval process because they feel they weren't adequately consulted uh, in the last round of consultations that were supposed to take place over four months. Is this uh, another permanent roadblock, or will these court cases just keep rolling out and the pipeline stay not in the ground? Yeah, I mean, you kind of get the feeling that at this point, if someone is saying they weren't consulted, it's not because there wasn't an attempt to have this two-way process. It maybe is to do with grievances that aren't as readily visible. Uh, one, One of the distinguishing factors about Vancouver, of course, is that we have a cottage industry of of uh, uh, litigation and organizations that are in existence for the purpose of stopping development. Uh, they will litigate against just about anything that involves shovels in the ground. And so it should come as no surprise that after 18 lawsuits in the earlier portions of Trans Mountain, uh, all but one of which were lost because they were not sound legal arguments, uh, that we have a new flight of them in the final stages. So 
Um, I, I don't think anyone should be too freaked out that this is a temp. I mean, just as the sun goes down at night and the sun comes up in the morning, so it is that Vancouver's kind of eco cottage industry will litigate on anything that involves progress and, and jobs for British Columbians and other Canadians. Would it be possible for construction to continue because they say they want to have shovels in the ground starting pretty well around now? And uh, if there is a problem, we'll pay damages, but we're going to build this pipeline anyway. Yeah, I, I think that's maybe a, a fair approach. The, the chances are, based on how the litigants have done and the, the casino of project stopping, uh, previously it's probably a pretty fair bet that these will be uh, found pretty much the same as, as all the previous lawsuits. And uh, one factor that the uh, court uh, said was that this must be dealt with very quickly. So it's very nice when we have a court uh, making that ruling because it means that the wheels of justice will turn swiftly rather than uh, be slowed down. And, and I think uh, in, in truth, for the, the groups that are trying to stop things, it's not necessarily because they want to win a case. They hope to win a case, of course. But by slowing things down, maybe the project will lose interest and go away. That's been a very successful strategy in Canada over the years, and it's part of why I think there does need to be legal reform, but that's another story for another day. But I think for this one, we're going to see a, a swift resolution. There's so much at stake. So many jobs are involved. It's And you know what? I, I, I think anyone who uh, is is criticized, oh, you, you support this project that, that hurts the climate. Actually, it's the other way around. The Trans Mountain Pipeline will reduce emissions. It will also ensure that one of the world's most environmentally sound products can get to market efficiently. It will save our rivers and streams from higher risks coming from other forms of oil and petroleum transportation. So across the board, you know, this is the kind of project that you want in a country that cares about the economy and the environment. Well, also, too, the Aboriginal community is pretty divided on this because you've talked to people along the actual route and did they tell you that they were looking forward to it because of the jobs and economic security it would provide well I, i've sat with uh, chiefs in their in their offices uh on the line in their communities uh, because i wanted to go out as, as you know i did last summer i spent a good part of the summer uh touring around talking to people i discovered that you know it was to me it was a an opportunity to on the terms of these indigenous people go to their place to see if they would invite me to uh, their land to tell me on the, in those terms, you know, what I was seeking to find out, which was, you know, what, what are uh, the, the ways that you want to uh, Im improve the things that you see lacking in your life? I mean, they have this terrible unemployment problem. They have youth suicides that are absolutely heartbreaking. We all know about the water quality issues in many communities, um, the rural uh, struggle for women who are isolated in communities, have a hard time getting around. Uh, it, it's just legion problems. Um, there will never be a situation amongst Indigenous Canadians where 100% of people agree on any one issue any more than that would be in any other Canadian community. And it's, I, I think, rather condescending for anyone who, who feels that there has to be some sort of 100%. There, it will never happen, and it needn't happen. We'll have more with Stuart Muir right after this. Grand Portage Resources Herbert Gold Project in Southeast Alaska highlights increased gold resource, indicated and inferred, of 860,000 ounces, in excess of 10 grams per ton gold. Expansion drilling is planned on the Herbert Gold property for the summer of 2019. Grand Portage Resources trading symbols are GPG on the TSX Venture, GPTRF on the OTCQB, and GPB on Frankfurt. For more information, please visit our website, grandportage.com. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Stuart Muir. Stuart, is BC running out of logs for sawmills? We've just had another sawmill closure announced in Maple Ridge. And uh, other sawmills uh, through the year have announced closures or severe cutbacks. Is there a shortage uh, of fiber for them to go after? 
clearly there is. And this is a topic that is full of nuances, both at the regional level. You know, things are very different in the north and interior than on the coast. So, you know, one must be very careful before generalizing. Um, but you can't run a sawmill if you don't have logs. And that's the reason why all of these sawmills, now we have news out of Maple Ridge on, on an Interpore property uh, closing. That's terrible news for that community. Um, yeah, yeah. Log, the log, log exports too. I mean, you're touching on uh, a very hot button topic. A lot of people have very strong opinions on this one. Well, where I live in New Westminster, overlooking the river, I watch ships load raw logs every day for export. Should there be a law or rule saying you you can have the lumber, but we have to process it first? Well, I think there's a lot of pressure on that. Uh, when you see ships or barges or, or booms that are being transported on the river or in the Strait of Georgia, the Salish Sea, um, I, I think every vessel... And every cargo has got its own uniqueness to it. So there is a regional log market that applies to the Pacific Northwest, so BC and, and the South. There's, there's balancing amongst, uh, the different interests there. Increasingly, a lot of our Canadian chorus companies, which traditionally for a long time were really just operated in Canada, they're now international companies, they're diversified, they're in the US as well as Canada, uh, primarily, but they're, they're operating their companies with this um, international uh, vision. So they move things to where they need to move them. The, the log market is defended by companies. This is what they say as uh, part of the mechanism for being efficient with their mills. And I think anyone would want to build a mill if they could do it profitably. That's what I've heard. But the key is, of course, that it's something that you could take to the shareholders and they want you to do. And that that's difficult because there's so many conditions that make it more and more uh, challenging to operate in the forests and operate in the manufacturing area of, of uh, you know, sawmill production. Now, is this a case of there's international trade agreements that forces to export raw logs, or is this a matter of slack legislation in Canada? Um, well, I, you know, I think that's a little bit of a loaded question, Jim. Um, that There's you, you go into the industry, you've got very diverse views on this. You know, those who work in the woods, you know, the, the, say the truck loggers association, the people who are out there doing the harvest and then providing through whatever form, uh, the, the logs to the mills, they, they just want to be at work doing the harvest. So they're not really concerned about where the logs go. So you don't, you don't really hear them weighing into the issue the same way as some of the unions do. And I think this one is often, uh, an issue that that divides along uh, labor lines. You have uh, uh, thus a, a greater tendency for certain politicization of it, um, which which makes it a, a difficult issue. I think I think it's a testament to the complexity of it that we haven't seen an elimination of log exports in the new provincial government in Victoria, uh, even though the I, expectation, I think, from a lot of quarters was that there would be a shakeout and there wouldn't be log exports in future. I think once you look more deeply into this, you do realize the complexities of it and that, uh, you know, having, having the mechanism of log exports is, is a healthy part of it. But then you layer on top of that, of course, I mean, wh- what are you going to say to the 500 people who are out of work because of Bill in Vanderhoof or or uh, you know, an interior community has been shut down. You're, you're going to say to them, "We're exporting these logs to uh, Japan or or the U.S." Uh, that's not a message that anyone wants to bring to those people. Um, it is part of the complexity. You know, maybe there should be uh, an airing of all these issues and sort of get it all into a more neutral space where people who agree or disagree on the issues can kind of kind of share the facts and come to a better understanding. Because right now I think it's a source of a lot of uh, friction in in a lot of discussion in coastal areas, especially in the south and on the island. And despite a newly negotiated North American Free Trade Agreement, softwood lumber continues to be tariffed by the U.S. Uh, at a horrific rate. 
there's always hearings. Those tariffs are overturned, and the U.S. does nothing but slap them back on again. Is that very frustrating for B.C. lumber producers? Well, I think it's something that speaks to our commodity predicament in, in general. We're a country whose economy is still, in 2019, strongly reliant on commodity exports. There's a degree to which uh, the commodities we export are processed. I think a lot of value is actually put into um, even what looks like an unprocessed product because of the amount of environmental work that is done, all of the prospecting and the uh, the processes to extract materials, to do the initial processing, to move them, enormous amount of value added. In fact, the best value that could be got from that thing is is enjoyed by those who extracted at the earliest part of its transformation into eventually a, some sort of a product, consumer product or ingredient, um, which is contrary to uh, what common sense seems to tell you. You know, we, we, we think, oh, we, we want to have the factory that builds IKEA products. That's where you make the real money in forest products. Actually, it isn't. Why? Because you can have that factory anywhere in the world. There's no special advantage that anyone's got except cheap labor, maybe cheap at power, cheap electricity to do that, whereas with the resource industries, nobody, nobody can uh, have control over Canada's natural resources except Canada. And and so we have to endeavor to get the most value, but let's, you know, be sure we're focusing on where that value is and not where that value isn't. Stuart, anything else you wanted to add to today's show? Oh, well, you know, that BC Utilities Commission, I think there was another little sidelight that came out of it. We learned a lot about uh, uh, the, the the gasoline situation, gasoline pricing, but there's just a little footnote. I thought it's fascinating. So there's a kind of, uh, I've heard it called a conspiracy theory that the Trans Mountain Pipeline that exists today, the one that's going to be expanded threefold by adding a second larger pipeline, that pipeline is, so the theory goes, is under capacity and it's being artificially kept below capacity by some kind of nefarious activities by oil companies for their own reasons. And when they say they want to invest billions of dollars into the new pipeline, um, that that doesn't add up. That That's the, the conspiracy theory. There was a, a intervener at the BC Utilities Commission who advanced this thesis to explain why gasoline prices can be very high in the lower mainland. And I'll tell you what, the ruling is very firm and clear. It says, there is absolutely no evidence whatsoever to think that the Trans Mountain Pipeline is running under capacity. In fact, the opposite is the case. It's at capacity, and that's actually a big part of why we can see these high prices. And so the argument for the expansion is a very firm one, and I think that's one of the uh, side results of having this inquiry into gasoline prices. Stuart, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you, Jim. My guest has been Stuart Muir, Executive Director of the Resource Works Society. His website, resourceworks.com. His Twitter handle, at SJ Muir. If you have any questions for Stuart or any of our other guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. Find us on Twitter, at Howstreet. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.